Hey there. Hello. How's Are everyone we... doing? I think, uh, you know, we already got a few people tuned in and it's world premiere for me at least today. <laughs> I'm so happy to be part of it. I'm like, are we on? Oh yeah, we're... <laughs> we are on. <laughs> I had paused my own stream, so I didn't, I didn't notice. Yes, you're live. Have a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Yeah, usually um... I think you guys would expect uh, like an older white man, you know, with less beard, you know, so today it's not Stefan, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm super excited to be co-hosting this, uh, this with Deborah. Absolute pleasure. Hello, everybody. Yeah, super nice to be here and uh, great to be doing this with Lars as well. Do you like the, the way I pronounce your name, Lars? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we're really excited to be here. Uh, we're probably going to spend some time chatting with you guys, which will be the lols, uh, and then Later on in the show, we are going to be talking to Kate uh, and Alexi from the Global Game Jam, uh, which just wrapped at the end of uh, last month, I believe. And uh, we'll look at some of the entries that they really liked uh, and, of course, talk to them about how they set up the jam and, and how it works. Uh, for anybody who doesn't uh, know about it yet or hasn't heard of it yet, it will be uh, really interesting just to hear about how do you coordinate a jam all over the world simultaneously. What's that like? How do time zones work, Loss, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, I find it amazing. You know, I've been following the Game Jam for, for many years now. And uh, you know, we've also, in my previous company, hosted uh, part of the Game Jam, at least a local initiative uh, here in Germany. And uh, it's just amazing like how they coordinate everything and bring it together. So I'm super excited about being part of the show and understanding more about it, uh, how it works in the background. I think there's a lot of chaos involved as well, like in getting everything, everybody together, especially we talk about creative people here. So uh, I, I find it always amazing to see the results of like what people put together in, in such short amount of time and uh, how many amazing ideas come out of that. Uh, and I, I think they also have the themes every uh, every time they do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's really cool to see how people brainstorm about what they can deliver on those the uh, themes and so on. So uh, really excited about this one. I'd also be curious, by the way, like of the people that are here in the in the chat, if uh, any of you participated in uh, a game jam uh, so far and how your experience was, uh, it'd be cool to know. Yeah, definitely. And if you guys uh, in the chat have questions throughout, feel free to fire them out at us. Dana, my my favorite, am I allowed to have favorites? I feel like I am. Um, hi, Dana. <laughs> it's nice to see you. She says, hey, hey Lars, Dana. aren't you doing this wonderful DevCom podcast? Where can we find it? Tell us everything. Wink, wink. That's a really nice segue, Dana. So Lars and I have never actually done this show together, uh, and we figured maybe we should introduce ourselves to each other. Lars, do you want to go first? And you can also talk about the podcast. Sure, absolutely. So first of all, Dana is already my favorite person. <laughs> I gotta say because you know when I read this like wonderful DefCon podcast, which is great. Yeah, so um, I'm actually the host of uh, the DefCon podcast. Um, uh, I've recorded about 25 episodes or so already. We haven't released as many. So originally we were mostly on Patreon, uh, but now we opened it up and uh, we are releasing one episode every single week on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, German time. So uh, if you're interested in checking out the latest episodes, you can pretty much find them on all the different podcatchers. So whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can even uh, go to your Alexa if you have one and just ask for the DEF CON podcast. Be careful, there's one that's about military stuff. <laughs> it's, it's called similarly, but uh, you know, the DEF CON podcast is, is always available on, on Wednesdays and it's super fun doing that. But obviously it's not my, my main job, so just to, um, fulfill uh, Deborah's request uh, for an introduction on my part. I uh, have many different roles, but my day job is uh, working in studio relations within uh, Koch Media, which is a German uh, publisher and developer of video games. And I work with all our studios that we have and uh, supporting the leadership teams there to uh, actually help them make uh, better games, connect them with others in the group. Uh, so that's a lot of fun doing that. Uh, I'm focused right now on many different uh, topics, mostly in the field of live operated games. How do you keep games alive for a long time and uh, how do you bring that to existing IPs? So that's uh, mm -hmm. kind of what I do mainly. And I'm also uh, connected to DEF COM and Gamescom through being a part of uh, the board of GAME, the German Industry Association. I'm one of five board members there. And that's how I originally got in touch with 
everything around DEF CON and I thought like, well, why only, you know, do the, the stuff on the site, you know, when the fun part is to actually participate in things like that. And that's why I kind of volunteered to do the podcast. And, uh, you know, also I might uh, every now and then be mm -hmm. hosting the uh, Twitch show here or co-hosting like today. So uh, really happy about this. Love it. You are the voice of DEF CON, Lars. Well, in in a in a way, I think you are probably I mean, the voice of, of DevCon because you're listening and, you know, to Twitch shows and, uh, you, so. and the podcasts. <laughs> we're just getting them started. I mean, we're still trying to build a community about this, but I'm super amazed by how much positive feedback I've received so far on the podcast episodes that we've done. And quite frankly, it's it's also fun recording them because I get to talk to a lot of people in the industry. Some of them being legends. Uh, I, I talked to. David Bateson, for example, the voice of Hitman, he, the, the guy's been doing it for over 20 years now. And it was really fun. We uh, made him read a few lines from video games and and movies, and he did it in the Hitman voice. Uh, so that, oh, was, that was really cool. So you should definitely <laughs> check this episode out. I think it was released last week or the week before. Uh, so uh, okay. it's really cool to do that. I do love a good podcast. Uh, I've written there's something about it. It's uh, I think sometimes I prefer it even you know to watching something, but just something about the podcast is just like listening to somebody's conversation. Uh, it's like you're in the room and just sort of listening to people talk. I don't know. There's something about it that I that I really that I really like. So I'm definitely going to tune into your podcast as well. Is there like yeah, um, what I especially like specific... is the uh, is that dialogue format that you have a person you talk to. I mean, there's some podcasts where people just you know ramble and you know talk about stuff, but uh, I really like it if you yeah. if you have <laughs> guests and it's kind of a natural conversation. There's some podcasts that I see out there where you know it's almost scripted. Uh, there's some questions that have been shared with the guys up front, and they pretty much read their statements or something like that. That's that's yeah. boring. You know, I want to have a natural conversation, and sometimes you know they're a little bit controversial. Sometimes you know we're super aligned. Uh, we try to cover many different areas of game development and everything that's relevant for the industry right now. A lot of topics around diversity and inclusion, which is something that also, uh, you know, helps uh, spread the spread the word and supports the diversity and inclusion summit uh, that's going to come up, the call for change summit that we have in a, in a few days uh, for DEF COM. So there's a lot of things we try to connect uh, with other things that we do around DEF COM. Yeah, no, definitely. And but, uh, but how really about yourself? Fun, I mean, I ask a lot. <laughs> you ask me, and I, so I mean, you're you've been a host for a while, but now I need to oh, know what are the highlights <laughs> about Deborah. I was just about to start talking about the summit next week, but um, yeah. Before hello. we get there, just, just uh, a few <laughs> things about yourself. I'm Deborah. Uh, so I have been at, so like Lars, I uh, come on and host the show or co-host the show. Um, at uh, you know different intervals, it's always a, a good time, and I I love talking to just the different guests that we have on the show, which are so varied, and I find like I always learn something new, and uh, it's always a good laugh, uh, or even get to meet new co-hosts, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, I've been in the industry for well, like seven and a half years or so. I started out in console um, at Xbox, and then after a few years, moved into mobile at Space Ape Games. Uh, and I've always been kind of, uh, you know, a content person. My background is actually in journalism. So I was uh, in journalism for like another seven years before I went into gaming. Um, so a lot of my, I guess, skills from journalism transferred over into games. And I've always loved storytelling and uh, how we can work with content to, to reach people, etc. So that's largely what I've been involved in. But we've worn a lot of different hats, uh, you know, from... Uh, marketing and project management to, you know, bringing in video and live streams and that kind of thing to, to various different studios that I've worked in. Um, and then over the last few years, where my heart has really been pulling me is around how we can use games for, for social impact and how we can use games to, uh, you know, talk about humanity and to connect to each other better and to use it to solve some of the world's most pressing problems like climate change or, you know, we mentioned the, the diversity um, and inclusion and accessibility summit that's coming up next uh, next week. So, yeah, how can we use our industry and games and the players and empower the players to, to basically make this world a better place? And so I started my own company um, consulting on that front back in the summer. Uh, which has kept me very busy, but which I have loved. And yeah, the best thing is just really meeting tons of people in this space who kind of tick the same way and who are all doing like innovative and um, just inspiring things that really keeps you motivated. You know, everybody, I'm sure everybody's had a year <laughs> last year 
while it's still going. Yeah, but, absolutely. And you know, you can get really, yeah, you can get really fatigued and kind of worn out, and there's not much else besides work really. Good. So you can't really just like tired, and then I can have one phone call at the end of the day with somebody who's doing something really wicked in the industry, and I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm energized again. I'm ready to do more stuff. So. Yeah, I just, I love that my work is the thing that like really gets me energized about life <laughs> uh, and the people that I meet do that. So it's, it's been really lovely. Does that, I think is it's that the amazing good? people in games, you know, I, I the same uh, feeling here on my side, whenever I talk to people that are passionate about what they do, and we have a lot of those folks in the games industry, you know, it inspires. Uh, and there were plenty of reasons in 2020, and also now this year, actually, <laughs> it didn't continue yes, much yes. better, at least the first couple of months. So there are plenty of reasons that you need inspiration. And, uh, you know, I, I'm super excited talking to those guys, whether it's on the podcast or part of my my other role. So I, I can totally relate to what you were just saying. There's, uh, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of uh, inspiration, a lot of passion that you that we need these days, I would say, especially because we can't meet, you know, in person. Yes. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, other than that, I don't know, I was telling last before we came on, I had my snacks. We were comparing favorite snacks. Mine is a uh, Mawam. I'm huge into Mawam. And Laz, hold up your snack. Yeah, yeah, I got I got to do this now. So uh, whoever hasn't had these here, sweet and salty pretzel pieces, they are incredibly addictive. There's, there's yeah, no way you can by. open them and not finish them. <laughs> You know, honestly, they're like the best snacks ever. And I don't have shares in the company. I'm just saying, you know, that they're amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, this show is sponsored by the, by, by Milo Amen. By Snyder's Pretzel Pieces. pieces. <laughs> exactly. And also these cashew nuts, which I've been occasionally nibbling on. Um, but, <laughs> uh, so, uh, what, what did we say? Oh, yeah. So today, yes, we're going to talk about the Global Game Jab. Really excited. Um, I think we're going to take a break in a few minutes just before we bring on the guests. Um, but before we do, Lars, what are you most looking forward to chatting to Kate and Alexi about? Well, actually, about uh, how they how they put all this together. I mean, they've been doing it for many years, uh, the Global Game Jam, and uh, I just want to learn a little bit more about the the organization of all of that. I already mentioned it earlier it, it, there must be a lot of chaos involved. Uh, there's a lot of dedication, a lot of passion by the people doing this. And I, and I think there's also probably a lot of head scratching, you know, how do, how do we get this done? Uh, yeah. Coordinating so many people around the world uh, that all do this on a voluntary basis. Uh, so that's what I'm curious about. How did they, how did they put it together? Uh, how's everything uh, coordinated uh, between the different regions? And, uh, and then maybe, you know, some hard facts, like where do the most games come from? What are the most active communities within the Global Game, uh, game Jam? Uh, so that, that's mm -hmm. what I'm curious about. How about yourself? Uh, on uh, all of those things, yeah, definitely the logistics of the jam. Um, and then also what you mentioned, the you know, the last thing about where do most of the entries come from and maybe where have they not come from that they would like to see um, or the new ones that have popped up, you know, more recently that they didn't see before. I think that's always really interesting to see how like, the industry is expanding and the new sort of corners of the world that are exploring this stuff. Um, and then also, like, how do they go through the, all the entries? <laughs> Like how many people does it take yeah. to really go through all of the entries and um, are they are they just delighted by every single one or at some point are they like, if I have to look at one more game, you know, is there a point? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, would, I know that feeling sometimes. Yeah. So I do a lot of support for for indies just in my my free time because I you know I I feel if there are people that are passionate about making games and sometimes you know those those games come from the original game jam original uh, from, from the global game jam originally and uh, you know I, yeah. I, I, there are moments where like I, I've seen like I don't know 20, 30 different games today yeah I feel, it's I love them all but. You know, I, I feel like I'm not fresh enough anymore to give them like constructive feedback. If I've already seen like 29 of them, this is 30 is one. Yeah. So I I, to, I totally get like exactly. that. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a game fatigue. <laughs> on any given exactly. Day yeah. It's someone is just. Um, but it I think that's good, just what they live bad. with uh, all being a global game jam, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I'm I'm really uh, looking forward to it. And yeah, just just seeing some of the entries uh, is what I'm really looking forward to. We will. Uh, An interesting part uh, from from my side is also like there's. There's a lot of cool concepts that come out, uh, you know, during a game jam, and then sometimes I find it very interesting to see how many of those concept, uh, concepts actually, um, you know, make it into something 
a bigger later on. So how many teams can actually take it further? And a lot of that, from at least from mm. my gut feeling, depends on uh, the ecosystem around it. Uh, I've seen uh, great entries in, in certain regions, but apparently there wasn't enough support around it, so they could actually make it make it something bigger and and ultimately right. develop something like this into a game. Uh, so I'd be curious, like to learn more about what kind of support networks after a global game jam would be helpful, uh, especially in territories mm -hmm. where there might be a lot of creative talent, but maybe not uh, the the necessary supportive ecosystem around it yet, and how we can support this and, and make sure that there's uh, there's even more collaboration going on so that, that developers from pretty much all of the world have you know similar chances of of coming up with a with a cool idea and making that making it into the game. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point actually. Yeah, how do you I mean there's uh there's been tons of studios that have been formed like out of the game jam, right? It's like they came up with a cool idea in yeah. a game jam and then just built a whole studio around that. So um yeah definitely true. I am also looking forward. I think we're going into a break. Um, by the way, if you hear voices, Nicholas and Sebastian are behind the scenes. And sometimes I will talk to them um, as they guide us through this show, because I have no shame when it when I break the fourth wall, like I said earlier. <laughs> uh, so yes, do let us know when you want us to go into break. And since I'm the noob here, you know, I just follow your lead, Deborah. <laughs> Well, they're not speaking to me right now, so I don't actually know. <laughs> I, I don't know if they're still there. You know, nobody knows. Nobody, <laughs> maybe, nobody maybe there knows. is no break. Maybe the break they just is left, alive, left you know? us and they've like gone for a beer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Are you there? Are you there? Ah, yes, okay. we are where, but we wanted to do it a little... Um, more secret? More secret, so we started texting you. Maybe oh, you, you could take a, take a look, Deborah. Oh, do you mean you mean on Skype? Your I just saw your messages come up just now, but it was yes. after I'd already talked about you. <laughs> so uh, well, we, okay. we do everything no, out in the got, open, I think. So there's no time. secrecy here, you know. <laughs> no, we're it's an, we're an open book. Um, so no, we've we've got a bit more time, so that is okay. Uh, <laughs> In the meantime, by the, uh, by the well, way, we can use we can use the time also the to do some week. featuring of a podcast episode that I did with Kate, uh, who's going to come on board in a, a little while. Uh, we we talked not only about the global game jam a little bit, but also about her work in general, her path in the industry, uh, and uh, it was a lot about uh, you know the topic of diversity and inclusion, and we we uh, touched some very difficult topics. Uh, we we talked about harassment in the industry, which unfortunately became a bigger topic last year. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, you know companies uh, have you know, since rethought uh, their approach to that, and uh, you know there were quite some shakes shakeups in the industry, I would say, following uh, that. And uh, it's an it's a very interesting episode. So if you get the chance to to check it out, um, it's definitely something that I would recommend. Uh, Kate is a is a wonderful person to talk to, so I can't wait to have her on the show today. Um, but uh, we've also had this this uh, really cool recording with her, uh, and uh, it's it's just interesting to learn about uh, you know the path into the industry. Uh, she's been a, a cartographer actually, um, and uh, is something that uh, I find a very interesting background to make it into games. But apparently, yeah, uh, you know this is uh, uh, this helped her, uh, and uh, still to this day, you know, kind of uh, defined her role and uh, the company she works for. Yeah, no, definitely. She's she's lovely to talk to. Yeah, that that background of like geography and then um, you know cultures across the world and how does that get represented in games and stuff. Super super interesting. And uh, speaking of uh, what you were just saying as well, uh, we can talk about the summit because we have time. So uh, next week, um, if you don't already know, we are holding our Call for Change Summit uh, on the 25th and 26th of February, which is next. Thursday and Friday, um, we're going to be covering uh, different uh, topics, everything from hiring and building a diverse team to representation in games and accessibility, um, as well as, as mental health. So uh, it should be uh, an interesting couple of days. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I get to moderate a couple of the, the panels as well. We've got some really great speakers. So we're hoping that it won't just be, you know, a lot of conversations, but really, um, yeah, insight from people who are actually making changes within the, in, within the industry that hopefully other people can, can replicate and take something away from and, and do <laughs> rather than just, you know, talking about it. So I think we've talked about it a lot. So it's time to, to actually do things. And I have been given the okay 
that we can now go into a break. All right. <laughs> and see you guys soon. Hello. 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 <laughs> With more faces on the screen, which is really nice. <laughs> yeah, we doubled in the meantime. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've multiplied uh, over the break. Um, yeah, so a very, very warm welcome to uh, Kate and uh, Alexei. Uh, super cool to have you on board to talk about the Global Game Jam. Thank you. Yeah, thanks thank very you. much. It's great to be here. Would you guys like to um, just introduce yourselves to people who may not know who you are and just a little bit of your background, and then we can get into what is the Global Game Jam? Sure. 
Um, so I'm the executive director of the Global Game Jam organization. So I basically run the global organization. Um, as far as my background, I have been in the video game industry for almost 28 years now um, as a geographer who does culturalization work. So I basically help game developers make sure that the great games they're making are going to work everywhere in the world and not from a localization perspective, uh, not necessarily translation, but more about everything else in the game, the character design, the, the use of different themes and environments and all that kind of stuff. And uh, But I've also uh, spent time running the International Game Developers Association and have been a pretty vocal advocate in the game industry for the last uh, decade or more. And so, yeah, so that's that's basically my background. I mean, I've, I've had the, I've been really fortunate to work on a lot of games that you probably know, like Halo and Age of Empires and Fable and all the Bioware games. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff over the years. Kate, in a nutshell, yeah, so how about I, you, Alexei? Alexei Zvalov, and um, I joined uh, game development out of passion to create um, and desire to create my own strategy game. I was always uh, being a fan of Sid Meier's Civilization and other strategy titles like Total War and Cossacks, and I had a dream to create uh, my own game. So I started programming, then art, uh, design, and so on. So first I started making flash games, uh, then moved to mobile. It's like uh, from indie perspective. Uh, also, I teach students, teach programming, and uh, as uh, an educator, I involve uh, my students too and indies who I know into the global game jam movement and other game development activities. And I worked as developer relations at such publishers as uh, FGL and Enhance and Lion Studios. Okay, Alexi in a nutshell. Uh, no, thanks so much uh, to both of you guys. Um, for people who may not know what the Global Game Jam is, can you tell them? I mean, it sounds like what it is, but I think <laughs> really like the the logistics and um yeah how how that really works in practice can you can you talk about that yeah absolutely so the global game jam to put it sh briefly is the world's largest game creation event and basically to give you a little insight of where it came from so it, it actually started in the game education special interest group within the international game developers association uh, many years ago i think it was 13, 14 years ago is when it got started. And so it was started by a group of educators who basically felt that when you bring people together to jam, it's a great educational opportunity and it's, you know, you can increase your skills and, and you know, practice collaboration and working with others, which is a great, you know, practice for going into the game industry. And so it just every single year they conducted this, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger until it got so big that um, basically the IHDA and the Global Game Jam parted ways and the Global Game Jam became its own nonprofit entity in 2013. And it's interesting because I was I had just come on board to run the IGDA right when the Global Game Jam was leaving. And so I kind of oversaw that departure. And then here I am years later actually running the Global Game Jam. Um, so from a logistics standpoint, as you can imagine, it, it's it's quite extensive um, because this has become such a large event. Just to give you some perspective, in 2020, um, which was another record year for the Global Game Jam, because every year of the jam has been uh, has happened, with the exception of 2021, um, has been a record-breaking year. So in 2020, we had almost 49,000 people in 118 countries at 934 live sites, and they made about 9,600 games in one weekend. And um, and then this year, because of COVID, we pivoted to an online format, which had its own challenges because normally people convene at a live site and they jam together shoulder to shoulder, which is part of the fun mm. of doing the Global Game Jam. But obviously we couldn't do that this year. So we had to pivot to the online format. Um, but we still got tremendous engagement. We were really happy that we, we still had about 29,000 people um, in 104 countries at 585 virtual sites um, who participated, and they produced over 6,400 games or around 6,400 games in the weekend. So that's still pretty staggering. <laughs> it's still pretty good. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, looking at the uh, the virtual event this year, I mean, I can imagine it was quite a change, and uh, you know, you had to probably rearrange all the logistics around it, and uh, you know, get people uh, used to that format. So, looking back, and I think the event this year was about three weeks ago. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, what did you learn for next year's, and is there any? Any wish, uh, despite the fact that we all want to get together in person again, but do you want to keep part of that virtual component uh, for future game jams? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, for years, I think the 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 basic policy of the Global Game Jam has been that we don't do virtual sites because we really want to emphasize people gathering together and collaborating together because there is obviously a, a whole different dynamic when people are in the same room together. And you're going to throw ideas up on a whiteboard and stick up post-it notes and all that fun stuff. Um, it's a little bit tougher to do that virtually, even though we've a lot of us have had the past year kind of forced to learn how to do that virtually. So we've gotten better at it, I think. Um, but we don't want to lose that, obviously. But at the same time, we've heard a lot of great uh, anecdotes and feedback from people who found that the having the virtual access actually is really helpful for all kinds of reasons. For example, in some countries, it's tough to get into the rural, uh, from the rural areas into the urban area. Maybe they can't afford to go to the urban area where most of the jam sites take place. And so, you know, if they don't have to travel and they don't have to spend money to travel, then they can actually, you know, participate remotely. Um, and also, of course, there's people with accessibility concerns where they are not able to actually go uh, physically to that site um, for various reasons. And so this also would open it up to them as well. Um, and so I think we've learned some really great lessons about how we can walk that balance between still emphasizing the on-site experience, but making sure we can be inclusive of people who can't participate. Right. Uh, also, uh, this is okay. a really great point. And also from uh, my observation, a virtual event uh, increased, uh, helped to increase the connectivity between, uh, with the Roma, between the um, jammers from different sites. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, from different cities. Uh, usually when we organize global game jam in Ukraine, uh, there are like re regular global game jam uh, on the last weekend of January or whatever date it is. And then about in one or two weeks, uh, we ask the jammers from different cities to come to our central location in the city of Kropnitsky, where Global Game Jam Ukraine started. And there they play the games of each other. They get uh, connected. They um, they introduced to the jammers from different cities. And virtual event made it much easier. And uh, now we see the the games made by teams from Dnipro, Odessa, or Kiev, Lviv, and so on. I mean, I'm curious, uh, learning more about the, the countries and the, the regional initiatives. I mean, Alexei, you're obviously one representing a regional uh, part of the of the Global Game Jam. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess there's a lot going on in the Ukraine. But I'm curious, like, when we look at overall stats, so what are traditionally some of the, you know, the strongest uh, regions in terms of participation in the Global Game Jam? Is there something like that or is it, like, very evenly distributed? And, uh, and then the second part to, to the question would be, like, how did it... Uh, look like this year with uh, the event being virtual is it, it did anything change in that regard that that's a great question yeah we too. Uh, well basically as Ukraine it, and uh, our neighboring countries <laughs> russia belarus uh, Lithuania, there are uh, uh, many game developers and the tradition of uh, making games and exchanging thoughts on the forums in the chat uh, exists since uh, the beginning of uh, 2008 or so. Uh, so, uh, and there were uh, various game development contests, game development events held on the forums on game dev, flash game dev uh, in other communities. And uh, game jam came, uh, global game jam came as a natural uh, unification of uh, different game developers. It came to a prepared soil. Uh, there is a very fun story how we brought gl uh, Global Game Jam to Ukraine. At that time, already uh, there were uh, game, jam, uh, game Jam locations in Russia and Belarus. And in Ukraine, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, we decided to organize a small event, like for the start, uh, in my home city, Kropivnitsky, there are three universities and uh, uh, we uh, came to the uh, head of the University of uh, Flight Academy, uh, where I teach students, and uh, 
asking, okay, let's, uh, what do you think about creation at uh, global games in location uh, for, for our city, for three universities, the students will come to us and uh, 48 hours to create games. So then the, our uh, Serhii Nidilko, head of our academy said, okay, is this a in international event? Yes. Will we participate for the first time as a country? Yes. So why would you create a small event? Why don't you invite the students from other cities to our city, from other universities? <laughs> so right from the beginning, uh, and he provided all the help, like uh, with logistics, with uh, uh, sp finding sponsors, uh, uh, inviting other universities. So uh, in 2016, uh, the developers, mostly students, but also the developers from uh, regular studios, uh, success, uh, successful studios, came to our city. Then in 2017 again, and since 2018, we started helping uh, the local communities in the capital, in other cities, in Odessa, Lviv, uh, Dnipro, to create their own locations and continued gathering them together uh, to get connected and to help them uh, see each other's work, see each other. It's amazing. I can definitely like feel there's a lot of passion in the Ukraine about thing. the about the global game oh. jam. So if we look at the other <laughs> regions, Kate, uh, what's what's there? You know, what are the, the strong territories in terms of like output and uh, you know and, and participants in the in the game jam? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, Ukraine and I think uh, Eastern Europe and, and that region in general has has really shown a lot of passion for the event, which is which is super cool. I mean, what I, what I love is that we we get representation for virtually everywhere, at least a certain degree. Um, certainly, as you would expect, there is a heavy involvement from North America. Um, we have a lot of sites in North America. We have a lot of sites in Europe. Um, but we have, and so I I would say even with the virtual format this year. Generally speaking, the relative involvement from different regions around the world was basically the same. So we still had basically the same kind of level of engagement. Um, we, I think we did see uh, much more engagement from China this year. Um, in fact, they were the top site, in, in, at least in terms of registered jammers. Um, so, you know, from year to year, it depends. I mean, like we've had um, it, oftentimes Cairo has been one of the biggest sites of, for the Global Game Jam um, year after year. And they were still, I believe, in the top five this year. So, you know, I mean, the, the virtual format kind of threw a wrench in, in various plans. But generally speaking, we had some really good engagement. So um, what's exciting, though, for us is, is also being able to see which new territories or countries get involved. And I believe this year we had our first site in Kazakhstan, um, if I wow. remember that correctly. Um, and even in New Caledonia, we had our first site in New Caledonia this year. And so, yeah, every time we get that, I mean, like we, we of course, we have sites in Iran. We've got we've had sites in South Sudan in the past. Um, so the more you know countries and regions that we can cover, the the better. I mean, we're we get really excited about that. Anytime we can add a new territory, um, I'm still working on Antarctica, and I'm actually <laughs> still working to see if I can get somebody on the International Space Station to be involved, even for a little bit. <laughs> so someday, those are those are stretch goals. And then as soon as we get that, uh, you know, rocket to Mars, that'll be the next entrance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll I mean, talking about too. the ISS, Kate, you, you probably should have done it when Richard Garriott was up there in 2008. Yes. You know, he was, I think he would have gladly <laughs> taken part in that. I, I think so. Yeah, the missed opportunity. Yeah, but but I, uh, I think he can make some connections uh, <laughs> to, to make this yes. possible. Yes. <laughs> No, it's uh, it's really interesting, and of course, with so many different locations, a lot of I mean, it's largely volunteer run uh, the jam. How many volunteers do you guys usually get involved in this, and what kinds of different things do they have to look at? I mean, Lars, uh, before you guys came on, said you know it looks like a really well oiled machine, but behind the scenes, we wonder is there is there ever any chaos? People pulling out their hair, or or is it all just smooth sailing? What does that look like? Well, I, I would I would say that you know we 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 have just the best volunteers you can find. I mean, they're amazing people, and it starts with we have sort of a hierarchical structure. I mean, obviously we have paid staff on the Global Game Jam side. Um, then we have what we call our executive committee, which is sort of like the really core volunteers who who um, pretty much a lot of the 
the main responsibilities for some of the logistics are are on their shoulders and they they handle it fantastically well um you know so i encourage you to look at our website you can see all the folks on the on the ec as we call it um mm -hmm. but then we also so then we have regional organizers so i believe we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 if I'm not mistaken, um, regional organizers, and as the name implies, they basically oversee a particular chunk of the world. And then we have site organizers. And so those are the people running the actual individual sites. And um, so that's like, in this case, 585 virtual sites. So we had 585 site organizers this year. Um, and so, yeah, and so... So basically, you know, we have this huge group of people um, who make this a reality for everybody. And so we, we're just ridiculously thankful um, to all the volunteers who help. And of course, for every site organizer, for every regional organizer, you know, there's a lot of other people in the cloud around them who are also helping, especially when we do live sites, because as you can imagine the log logistics of running a live site there's a lot to do, you know, food supply and power and internet and all that other stuff that has to happen. So, um, so I would say it is a whale oil machine, especially after all of these years of, of doing this, we have it kind of down, we know how to work this. Um, that's why having to do the online pivot for this year was a bit challenging because we mm. didn't know what that was going to look like in terms of the actual logistics. And especially how do you how do you do an online event, but still preserve the feeling of the global game jam, um, which up until that point had all been about, you know, convening together uh, physically on site. And, um, you know, so looking at the jammer surveys that we've, that we're getting answers back on right now, I think for the most part, we nailed it. It sounds like based on jammer feedback that most people felt that it still felt like a global game jam event, um, even as strange as the format might have been. So, so that that's good. I mean, we're we're glad to see that. What are some things you think uh, help that? Uh, you know, to to make sure that connectivity does stay there and that intimacy does stay there when everything is happening online and and remote, etc. What what were some things that you guys did to try to ensure that? Well, what, one of the things that we did, um, we of course, we have we have a keynote video that we release every year at the beginning of the jam. And now normally, in the keynote video, of course, is when the theme is revealed, which is really what a lot of the, that's what the jammers want. It's like, show us the theme, because as soon as they know the theme, then they just start rolling forward and developing. And so this year, it was challenging, because normally, the theme video is released to the site organizers, and then they release it at 5 p.m. on that Friday in their time zone so it kind of starts mm. you know way over in new zealand and then it rolls its way around the world all the way to hawaii over 24 hours um this year though because it's all virtual we decided to do a kind of an event of a virtual release um so we did that a day in advance so we did it 24 hours ahead of new zealand's start um and it was a little bit weird to do it that way because people aren't used to that especially because all of a sudden the whole world now knows what the theme is even if the official start time um in their location hasn't hasn't come yet so it gave people a little bit more time to think about um what what they're going to do with their theme and of course no doubt some people already got started um, with their development as soon as they knew the theme, even though it may have been a, at least a day or two in advance of when their site was going to start. And we knew that that was a trade-off we had to do. Um, mm. The other thing that we did is we we kind of, we already had streaming that we've done, kind of like a global game jam stream where different sites would often get get on the stream and kind of show what, they, what was going on in their locale or talk to developers about games that they made in the past or games they're working on. So we really boosted that yeah. this year. And we had great stream teams that were spread around the world. Um, we had four teams and basically they kind of handed off the stream um, from one to another to basically kind of keep that kind of have the like this central global game jam channel or voice that people could tune into. Mm. And so I think that thread also really helped to kind of, you know, pull people together. So, um, and then of course we had, you know, we have our discords and then different sites have their discords. And so, you know, as much as we could, we were trying to implement a lot of these tools to make sure that people always had a place where they could go and feel like they're still connected to the community. That's great. And what about from um, like a, a regional level? I guess Alexi, you know, being on the virtual ground, um, what did what did you guys do to 
to try to, to create that feeling of community, really. Yes, yeah, this is very important to see uh, the people that everyone else is also working, that they're not alone. Uh, for example, uh, when like we are speaking about global game jam, but there is like another jam like Ludum Dare, when uh, it is 48 hours and you can check in Twitter that uh, everyone is posting their submissions and uh, their work in progress and you see that you are not alone. There are like 3000 people in the world work doing the same. So or the same uh, we wanted to, uh, the same atmosphere we want to create for, for Global Game Jam. So we first we gather the developers in, uh, in a chat. Uh, first we created a Telegram chat, like a widespread uh, solution for our region. but. Then we run a poll for the developers where should we run the presentations. Uh, about 95% voted for Discord. Uh, we set up Discord channel. And uh, the presentation itself, it's uh, vital uh, for, the, uh, for the game jam as an event. When people uh, create the game and they see, uh, they present it, they share via screen sharing this time, but to, uh, via screen sharing, but to the wider audience. And uh, also, we have our Facebook group since uh, the start of Global Games in Ukraine, and then they posted uh, looking for a co for a co a co developer uh, such requests. And we, as organizers, we also gathered information from those developers who just want to be developers, who didn't have enough uh, technical or artistic skills. And we explained to everyone that Global Game Jam is for everyone. Even if they can't uh, code well or can't draw nice pictures, they can help the teams by uh, tracking the time, tracking the tasks, uh, preparing presentations, writing texts. Uh, so we, um, it was our responsibility to help those individuals who just wanted to see how the game is produced, uh, to join the teams and to see, uh, to, to see it from inside. No, that's a really good point. Like, I'm, so I'm, uh, I'm curious. I mean, sorry, we Lars, already uh, talked a bit about uh, the theme. Uh, Kate, you mentioned that how important it is to uh, you know to mm -hmm. see the theme of this year being revealed, and uh, you know how excited and passionate people are about this. So, can mm -hmm. you tell us what the theme of this year was? I mean, to be honest, I looked it up obviously before, but uh, <laughs> for uh, for yeah, viewers, so, uh, would would be so good. And and I would also be curious about the process, how you get to that theme, and uh, how you develop it because I think it. Uh, you know, brings a lot of people together and uh, think about what a good theme uh, for for any year could be. Um, so I'm 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 just super interested in uh, how that process is. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 kind of a it's such a a cornerstone of the global game jam. It's something that we've really become known for, and I know a lot of other jam events have essentially replicated that that idea of like you know uh, selecting a theme and then you know having the jam built around the theme, which I think is great. Um, basically, the, what we do is we start the process several months in advance. So we have a theme committee and we have one of our great volunteers who runs the theme committee and basically convenes a group of about, I think it's about seven or eight people. And um, so they come together and basically, you know, they're in there, a mix of people from developers to academics, you know, to people from various levels of experience. Uh, and from around the world as well. And so basically people just start tossing out ideas. And I, of course I get to see the deliberations. Um, it's in a, it's in a channel on one of our, on, on our GGJ Slack that we use for organizing the event. And so it's fun to just kind of sit back and watch like all these ideas just being thrown on the wall to see if anything sticks. Um, for this year in particular, we got feedback from we did an initial survey with our site organizers and regional organizers um, way back in middle of, of last year as we were approaching the reality that we felt that, OK, we're going to have to do an online event. So we were we, we asked a lot of questions of our community to basically get a sense of their engagement with an online event. Um, what kind of concerns should we be thinking about? But one of the things that people expressed, a lot of people expressed, like, don't make the theme about the pandemic. We've, we've heard enough about <laughs> the pandemic we don't need a, a theme about you know about the pandemic so we took that to heart 
and made sure that in the deliberations, you know, I we kind of kind of remind ourselves of that every once in a while. You know, if the theme kind of sounded like it was too responsive to the pandemic, that like, okay, let's back off that and think of going another direction. Um, so basically, some ideas are thrown out. There's several meetings that happen, and it kind of narrows down and narrows down until finally there's like maybe, you know, two to five candidates, like of the top candidates. And, you know, sometimes, like, I think this year was pretty straightforward. I think it happened pretty easily. I mean, sometimes you can see some pretty heated debates around what the theme should be and why, which I think is great. I mean, people should express their, you know, their passion for a certain idea. But this year, I think once we settled on the theme of lost and found, I think that resonated with a lot of people, um, especially because you could argue that maybe it does sort of relate to the pandemic a little bit in a certain really broad sense. But I think um, that that idea just fit. It seemed right. And so once once it kind of narrowed down to that, everyone was just like, yeah, that's great. And so then typically what happens is that that theme suggestion then goes to the board of directors of the Global Game Jam to basically take a look. And if they don't have any concerns about it, then that is the theme. And uh, and then we go to great lengths to keep it secret <laughs> from that point on, because then, of course, we have to, you know, show it to our video producers and make sure we, we have it, you know, in the video and everything. But we try and keep keep it under the lid as, as best as possible because it's it's really the kind of the best kept secret of the global game jam every year has there so ever been a reveal yeah, the theme, theme and uh, I really that like lost it found uh, yeah, uh, is so, that it uh, or is there anything the around it that's for the video that you give like people as an inspiration for for the games they create mm -hmm. or is everything simply based on these two words lost and found well, words. we actually do. I mean, yes. it, in the keynote video, we have a little video segment that kind of start. We we often hint at what the theme is going to be by because we have little little we have photos or video segments and other things that kind of lead up to the actual reveal of the name lost and found. Um, so it kind of gives people a sense of, you know, what's coming. And that's also fun too, because when we did the live reveal on our Twitch stream, looking at the chat and seeing people trying to guess based on the images they were seeing was really great. And then, you know, finally they, they actually saw the theme, but um, so yeah, we give people a hint, but so so basically, but that's it. Other than just lost and found, that's what they get as far, mm -hmm. as far as the theme. But then what we do is we have something called diversifiers. And diversifiers are basically a modifier of the actual game creation process. So, for example, you could have really straightforward diversifiers like build your build your game with Unity. That's easy. I mean, two-thirds of our games are built with Unity anyway. Um, but, you know, so there could be like technology-based ones. Um, like we had one sponsor this year, a next nav who has this really cool technology that is not only uh, finds horizontal position with your phone, but also vertical position too, um, which can make all kinds of interesting games because now you can add the vertical dimension um, to your gameplay with your phone. Um, so that was a diversifier. You could try the next nav technology. Um, other companies like Sony and some of our, you know, others, Microsoft and others, they will introduce a just a theme like make a game um, that's like a four player cooperative game for a family or make a game that emphasizes diversity and inclusion, um, you know, or something like that. So basically it's just, it's up to the sponsors there. So we have sponsored ones. And then we also have ones that come from our community where we have people suggest diversifiers. And then we go through the process of kind of narrowing down because we get a lot of suggestions as you can imagine um you know so like one of the suggestions that that ended up as a diversifier this year was called fake news which is basically like make a game that deals with the topic of disinformation um so that's mm. something you can add but but you're still supposed to focus on lost and found as your main theme but you can add this other you know the diversifier to your game to kind of mix it up a bit so those I mean, uh, diversifiers, is that something that the, uh, uh, the individual teams can sponsors, simply pick you know, and, they, uh, and, oh, and choose as they like, or is the teams get assigned? How does that work? 
No, they. That's, uh, no, it's, it's completely their choice. So they, they, it's a complete. They can use any diversifier they want, or they can use nothing at all. So it's it's really it's just there as like an additional challenge because some game creators they really like, you know, they they're happy to just make their game based on the theme alone, and many do. But then some people say, well, I, w- I want to kind of mix it up a little bit and say I want to make the, I want to make a game to the theme, but I want to challenge myself. And see, can I make a game around Lost and Found that's a four-player co-op game, for example? Sorry, I think sometimes we like all talk at the same time. And yeah. It's a, a horrible mess. Um, Alexi, I know. <laughs> I think you tried to speak a few times, and I would also uh, be really keen to hear from you. You know, with that theme of Lost and Found, what were some of the more interesting ways that you saw that theme adapted? Because to me, it's always really interesting to see like you know, two words being interpreted in so many different ways by different people. So I'd love to hear about that from you. Yes, yes. So from what we saw by, uh, from the presentation of the games, uh, several developers just used it as a straightforward uh, by making a point and click uh, game or rather uh, lost uh, like fi- um, this uh, game genre when you, there are many, many items on the screen and uh, you should find uh, the specific items. Uh, there mm-hmm. was uh, also very creative interpretation, a very cute game uh, about a dog shelter. Like lost and found animals uh, and very uh, warm atmosphere, very kind game and uh, great graphics. I remembered it. Uh, so uh, another approach was a very f- philosophical approach and um, several developers did it this way. Uh, they uh, interpreted the team like losing your individual, uh, 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 losing individuality, like um, losing what uh, the human is uh, losing some human uh, 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 human traits, uh, maybe a character, and then finding again, uh, find uh, the play, uh, the player find themselves, and uh, then recreates what human is. Uh, there was uh, one game about a robot uh, who wants to become a human and finding uh, yeah. what uh, yeah. what is about to be to be human. Uh, also, uh, another. Uh, uh, series even of uh, straightforward in- interpretation was about Lost and Found Bureau. And they were different. Uh, one uh, In one game, you manage uh, the stockpile in the Lost and Found uh, Bureau. In another game, you interact with customers and they don't tell you what did, did they lose, but they just give you hints and you have to guess these hints and find. Uh, another, when you are in the fantasy world, Lost and Found Bureau, and you travel across worlds via portals and find some magical artifacts which someone lost. Uh, so yeah, there are m- maybe these four different uh, directions in the which developers followed. I really like how the theme does not limit creativity, just gives the direction and doesn't limit it. So play, uh, developers can do what, what they want with the theme. Oh, it's, it's really cool. And uh, so, I mean, oh. you mentioned a couple of, uh, <laughs> of games already, uh, Alexei, that have been developed in, in the Ukraine. Uh, I don't know if maybe now is a good time to start looking at some of those. Uh, that's what I was thinking. So maybe we can like open the website and, you know, click on a couple of the mm-hmm. games and you can maybe lead us through some of the highlights that you've seen. And uh, since it's so many, I guess that, uh, you know, you haven't seen them all uh, anyway. So maybe we can explore some of them together mm-hmm. and look at different countries and, yeah. and what oh, has been sure. created, if that's okay with mm-hmm. you guys. Yeah, yeah. that's a, a great segue. Definitely. It's, it's one of the biggest challenges I have. I, I mean, I love one of the best parts of this job is getting to interact with developers all over the world. That's, that's the, that's the coolest part, but the, the biggest yeah. challenge of this job is that there are so many games that get created. I just don't have the opportunity to play them all. Like, I mean, 9,600 games last year, <laughs> I think I maybe looked at a hundred of those, you know, cause I just don't have the time. And like this year, because we're only three weeks, you know, not even three weeks away um, from when the event happened, I've hardly looked at anything yet. Um, but I will. I mean, yeah. of course, you know, at, over time, we'll have a chance to go back and, you know, when we have a little spare time, that's what we do. Go through and browse uh, a lot of the cool games that are in there. But, uh, yeah, it kind of it's it's hard because you realize there's so many great things. And you'll never be able to see everything. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. And is there um, such such things winners of the jam? 
No, there isn't. So the Global Game Jam was expressly built on the idea of collaboration and education. So that's really what our our purpose is. I mean, we we have had many people suggest that we should turn this into a global competition, like you know, a huge bracket system or something. That's never going to happen. That's not who we are. Um, we do from time to time. We will have some sponsors who want to reward people for specific games related to their sponsored diversity. So that happens sometimes. Um, you know, certainly we've done partner jams that are outside the main Global Game Jam event um, where it's sponsored mm -hmm. by a certain company and they do some kind of pricing like that. But generally it's something that we don't, we as an organization don't do that because it's just, that's not our emphasis. And just, uh, you mentioned sponsors there. I was just really curious to know um, how, like, how does funding for the jam work? Um, you know, the sponsors that come aboard, and are they looking for potentially projects that they could then uh, adopt and bring forward? And that's sort of the interest of the sponsors or, or what kind of constellations do they come aboard in? Yeah, it's kind of all of the above. I mean, certainly some of the larger companies like Microsoft and Sony and Unity and a lot of our bigger sponsors, they don't need the exposure. Um, they're they're just here to support us because they believe in what we're doing and they love the mission of the Global Game Jam. Um, you know, especially when if you if you anecdotally ask developers in these companies, you know, where did you get your start? Um, uh, usually a high percentage are, are going to say, yeah, I made my first game at the Global Game Jam, um, yeah. which is really cool that's a whole nother project we're working on is to kind of emphasize the legacy of the ggj now that it's been around for so long um but for a lot yeah. of companies it's just to support you know especially because we're a nonprofit. for others it's because they want to test ideas so like last mm -hmm. year we had a company that will remain nameless because i'm not supposed to but they are a very <laughs> well-known game company but they wanted to explore game types that they have never done before and so they decided to make a diversifier to challenge developers um, last year. Um, and they they basically were hoping to see maybe 10 or 20 games that they could look at and kind of get ideas from. But they ended up, I think they had like 73 games, 73 different teams uh, use their diversifier. And so they were kind of overwhelmed. They're wow. like, how are we going to go through all these? It's like, yeah, welcome to our problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... You know, and so it, it just depends. Like we've had discussions with uh, some government agencies, for example, for example, like the uh, Center for Disease Control here in the United States is interested in p potentially doing like a partner jam to um, make games around, you know, uh, awareness of public, you know, about about the pandemic and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. how can we better prepare people and better educate people through a game about the pandemic and about best practices mm -hmm. for keeping safe? Um, you know, so there's a lot of interest um, for from different organizations on that as well, because they see this as this amazing, very unique opportunity to take an idea and test it in one of the broadest multicultural audiences, you know, in developer communities you're going to find anywhere. And, yeah. you know, to get that perspective is, um, you know, is re really valuable. And I know for me, with my geographer background, I am utterly completely fascinated by how, like to your point earlier, how the theme every year is interpreted from so many different locales and cultures around the world. It's just, it's just so cool yeah. to see that. Oh, great. So, uh, also, and we the have the website for, for right. the locations, uh, for the countries and for the locations. Uh, and here we come to a, a very delicate uh, issue, like on the global level, there is definitely no contest. And we always say to the developers that a main uh, aim for the Global Game Jam is collaboration, innovation and experience. Uh, but uh, the sponsors uh, on the local level, uh, they want to uh, um, to praise uh, the developers, uh, to highlight some of the games maybe with best uh, visuals or most uh, innovative games. Uh, so, like according to the uh, Central or uh, Organizational Committee guidelines, uh, there can be uh, uh, contest on the local level, but uh, the prizes shouldn't be uh, too big to uh, so that uh, the rivalry between the developers uh, shouldn't emerge. Uh, mm -hmm. And for yeah. the uh, local sponsors, uh, there are IT companies, game development companies, we invite them to judge and to sponsor the locations. Uh, there are universities, 
and uh, even um, government, like local government of, of the city, was involved to sponsor games. Uh, this year uh, in Ukraine, uh, Zagrava Games, who were uh, the organizers of the location, uh, yeah, since uh, 20, 2018, they were sponsoring, like, uh, highlighting the best games. And uh, in earlier times, maybe you remember, there were times where we could travel to the conferences. It was very long ago. <laughs> so we uh, had as our sponsors, as our partners, game development conferences, including Great Devcom. And we wanted to give the tickets to the teams which would benefit the best from them. Uh, so in mm -hmm. uh, this way, we uh, asked our judges to fill uh, the, uh, to make the rating of the game, of the games. Uh, like uh, the, uh, the developers who uh, submitted the game for the global game jam, and they also, uh, could also submit the game for the country rating uh, for a chance to get a ticket to the conference. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, uh, the first, second place, third, uh, they didn't matter much, uh, just this way. We had a pile of tickets from our sponsors, and the first place could select uh, the, the ticket to, uh, first, then the second place selected the free ticket, the third place selected the free ticket, and so on, up to like 25 or so developers. And uh, after the jam, like the jam takes place one weekend, but our work as uh, Global Game Jam Ukraine continued for the whole year because we supported our uh, developers with advice, with uh, valuable connections, uh, with um, how to, uh, what to do on the conference, uh, how to get the best of it. We, uh, even on summer conferences, we organized uh, a stands, a booth uh, for Global Game Jam where they presented their games. And it was a great boost for the creativity and great boost for team development. Uh, on these events. Mm. Wow. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, Lexi makes a really good oh, point go that there's, there's a lot of activity that goes on at the site level um, and at the regional level as well. Uh, you know, not even just during the jam. There's, you know, there's a lot, mm. a lot of times because those sites are actually representing a community that already exists in that locale. And so they're basically just, you know, forming a site to participate participate in the global game jam um, and then we we do know that some sites will run not necessarily a competition but they will have some kind of reward like they'll have a judging panel and they'll pick like the top three games or whatever um, to basically say okay yeah the good job you did it. And, and usually the prize is something nominal like alexi said it's like maybe passes to an event um rarely mm -hmm. it's cash you know, usually it's just something that could be helpful, like some software or a piece of hardware or something like that from a local sponsor. And that kind of thing, you know, if, if local sites want to do that as an incentive, we, we don't really have a problem with that. But um, we still, as the central organization, are, yeah, we're never going to be a, a competition like that on that scale. Mm -hmm. No, that, that makes sense for sure. Um, I think we had uh, the website up to take a look. Are there any, um, Alexi, that maybe jumped out at you that you think, oh, let's let's look a little more closely at that? And uh, Sebastian and Nicholas are behind the scenes and they're ready to listen to our directions when it comes to uh, navigating the site and if there are any uh, that we want to take a look at. I know Kate had the idea of maybe starting with a particular country um, oh, and, this is and the, going that way. Game, Animal Shelter, very beautiful on the top. Yeah. Great. Let's see. There's a video link. Let's have yeah, a yes, look. There's a video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just watch this for two hours as they make it now. <laughs> you have to see them make the game. Oh, amazing. Yes, yeah, the basic idea is that the client tells about themselves and you should pick the best uh, suitable <laughs> animal. <laughs> that cat looks like my cat, that shriveled one. I have a hairless cat and that's what he looks like. <laughs>
gosh. I wish I could. Where is he? <laughs> ah, amazing. Nice. Yeah. I wish I had my kitty here. He's, I don't know where he is. I think he's hiding with my, my friend uh, somewhere. <laughs> but he looks exactly like that art. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, there is also one fun story um, from uh, about the game jam theme. Oh, let's look. Uh, Lost and found office. I see it a bit below. Uh, which one? Ah, uh, there is. While you are looking for the country, I can tell one fun story about global game jam theme, but not from this year, but from 2015. Uh, my okay. uh, colleagues from Belarus told me at that time they were organizing global game jam. And uh, you know how the theme is announced? You just, uh, so you sit, you see the um, uh, intro from the Global Game Jam, from the sponsors, and then you see a set of pictures or videos which give you some hints. And then you see a phrase about the theme. But that was their first time of organizing Global Game Jam. And they see uh, intro, sponsors, uh, pictures. What now? And they started sitting, okay, so what do we do now? Let's wait till they tell the theme. And it appeared that what do we do now was a theme of Global Game Jam <laughs> in 2015. Ah, <laughs> so weird. there were very many creative games about uh, rapidly changing environment and the player had to react to this, uh, <laughs> to this change. Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> has the, okay, has the Game Jam theme ever look, been leaked? Uh, has there ever been a islands, scandal where it's been leaked? Uh, uh, it is in the top of the page. I noticed. It. Yes, mixed straight islands. Ingenious oh, idea. I think th this is the next Baba is you. Okay, uh, so there is also a video. So nice. you are like lost on an island and you can change the properties of objects. Like there is a wooden and sinking uh, um, like a boat or maybe uh, something is wet, but you take wet from it and you put wet, for example, to the fire or something else. So this is how <laughs> uh, the uh, the gameplay looks like. You uh, like uh, you take a property to your property storage, and then you mm -hmm. put this property of an object to the object. So the developer during okay. this uh, jam, the developer created own engine of uh, how to change the properties and how the objects change uh, by themselves. After oh, that. Wow. interesting. <laughs> Super cute. <laughs> I wonder if there's anyone who actually sits and, and goes through the 96 games, you know? If there's any like really hardcore diehard fans who are like, this is what I'm spending the next, how long would it take, do you think? I would, I would love to beat them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they want to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually yeah, about uh, seeing the games, uh, we had such a, um... Experience, Kate and kind of Alexi. I mean, how many of those customers. games are actually uh, to play kind of the, the game, foundation we of the, the seed the for something? Judging panel. We asked Jupiter Hadley, for example, uh, from Indie Game Jam. So we uh, gave uh, nom nomination uh, games, like uh, uh, the developers who expressed uh, uh, that they wanted to be seen by the streamers. And then we showed this video on the Game Jam meetup uh, in our home city. Um, and also this year, we didn't have uh, much time for this, but definitely we want to do this next year. Uh, we want to give a special prize for the jammer who would play the other jammers games after the jam and stream this uh, or put uh, somewhere to YouTube or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Lars, you were, you were trying to ask something of Alexi. 
Yeah, I, I realized only after a while that you know, like she was still uh, still speaking about some of my apologies. So uh, I was wondering, like, of the games that are um, created at uh, the different global game jam events, uh, it's it's it could be considered like the seed of something that that grows afterwards. So any experience, Alexei and at Kate, like, uh, how many of those games actually? Are continued in a way. So, how often do you, based on your experience, feel this is the foundation of something? Maybe even teams coming together and then ultimately mm -hmm. developing a game together. Um, how how often does that happen? And uh, did you already see some like it this year, based on the projects that you've uh, you've watched? I can tell you one story out of many, which I really like. Uh, so, in 2018, the theme of Global Game Jam was transmission. And uh, a team of three developers, they met each other for the first time on the location in Kiev. And they decided to make a game not about mechanical transmission or something, but about a secret service officer who would listen to the citizens' r r radio transmissions and find are they speaking about something forbidden. Uh, so they, uh, they made it in the atmosphere of papers, please, but about radio transmissions of citizens. So they created this game. As you said, we have uh, a country's rating to define who will get their free tickets to the conferences. Uh, they got the first place and they went to Prague to White Knights. Uh, there they presented mm -hmm. the game for the first time as they continued uh, working on this game. Uh, they presented it for the first time and they got tons of feedback uh, from... Uh, they were, this was their first time at the game development conference at all. So all this atmosphere, like people coming to your booth, playing your game, uh, this is incredible. So they continued working. And then they uh, submitted their game to other conferences, uh, uh, won several prizes. They even got uh, best uh, Unity game in December. So uh, in December 2018, um, 11 months after the jam in Kiev at Indie Blast. But they didn't release this game because they got feature spawn. Like they wanted to add this and that to the game, they rebuilt it completely. Uh, this game didn't see Steam yet, but they stayed as a, as a, as a team, these uh, three people. Uh, and in Global Game Jam 2019, they created a game, uh, the theme was uh, what uh, home means to you. They created a game about a lonely lighthouse and lighthouse keeper who live there. And they, uh, they learned about their mistakes, about adding extra features instead of releasing. And they released this game to Steam and got very positive reviews. And now they, uh, so they're working on uh, this game and new games more. Uh, so uh, like our main mission is not to make a certain game to, uh, to release, but to help people meet, uh, understand mm -hmm. each other and create a team and then support this, this team. Mm -hmm. But you know, to, to to add to add on that um, to to the broader point, um, that's one of the cool things about being able to be a part of the Global Game Jam is because I've heard anecdotes about basically anything you can imagine about what the Global Game Jam has meant to specific people. Like I know people who, you know, it was the first time they ever jammed at all, the first time they ever tried making a game. And then, you know, you run into them later, like, you know, five five years later more. And like now they're a programmer working in the game industry. And you're just like, wow, mm -hmm. good for you. Um, so it's <laughs> been a, a place where a lot of careers have launched. We know for a fact that there's a lot of games that have gone on to become commercially successful. So for example, I mean, this stretches all the way back to the beginning of the Global Game Jam because there was a game called Pulse that was made in the Netherlands back in 2009, and that got a publishing deal and uh, actually took off from there. And so ever since then, we've had a lot of games um, that have gone on to become commercially successful. Like when we had the theme Heartbeat, which I'm trying to remember what year that was. I think it was um, 2013, maybe. Um, there was a game called Love vs. Dub that became really popular. It was like featured at Starbucks games and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I know Super Hot also was a game that was prototyped initially at the Global Game Jam. And of course, I think most of us know what uh, Super Hot is or Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes was another mm -hmm. game that was prototyped initially at the Global Game Jam. So there's a lot of games that got their start Um in the global game jam and then you know fortunately the teams that created those they actually went on to 
to to stick together. Some many of them created their companies together. Um, they created these games together, went on to become successful. Um, and I've even heard stories about people who said they met their life partner at the Global Game Jam, <laughs> and now they're you know together and married or you know whatever the case may be. And I, that's also super cool. I love that. Wow. Do you guys have a, a favorite theme from from over the years that has stuck out for you? Oy, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's um, what what was the one? Well, I, I thought the home theme was actually quite interesting, you know, especially to see, especially interesting from the standpoint of how that was interpreted across so many different locales. Um, that one kind of stands out for me. Um, I also think the heartbeat one also was was really interesting to see because you got so many diverse kinds of games out of that very very diverse interpretations of what that means. So that was that was pretty fun too. How about you? Uh, I'm curious, how, like, how many of, uh, of the people that are or provide various uh, interpretation like a now or like a verb? I also, at that time, being a location organizer, I even had to uh, manage to get uh, about six hours instead of night sleeping, but to ma made my own game about, like, you drop a pebble to the water and you see how waves uh, spread from it and you create different patterns. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sounds so nice. Flowers, what were so, you saying? Uh, I'm, I'm curious, like, how many uh, games industry professionals, veterans that have been in the industry for quite a while, work on like all kind of bigger projects. How many of those still come and take part in the Global Game Jams? Are there, are there a lot of those? There is actually, and that's that's one of the things that I find really cool is that people who have actually, you know, they saw this, maybe initially it was a starting point for their career, but I think in general, if I'm remembering the statistics right, I think about 25% or so of, of our jammers every year are professionals. So they come back and they jam with us. And I, I've talked to, you know, many of them who are, you know, some of them are 10 plus years into their, their industry career, but they're like, I never miss the Global Game Jam. I, I <laughs> love doing it. Um, they, they, they feel like it's that one moment where it, they really get to kind of unleash their creativity and to be challenged in a way that is a lot different from like if you're working in a studio, especially if you're working on a large AAA type project where it's going to, you know, you'll see the the end of your work is two or three years away, if not longer. Whereas in the Global Game Jam, you can kind of flex your creative muscles in 48 hours. And, um, and that's really important. You know, it's one of the reasons why in addition to other stuff I do. I'm also on the board of TakeThis.org that deals with mental health in the game industry, um, because that's obviously a huge undercurrent to a lot of developers, um, you know, working in this field. And you know, being able to take a break, being able to refresh your creative battery, so to speak. And I know some people would say, well, working on a game for 48 hours straight is not necessarily taking a break. <laughs> that's pretty intense. <laughs> It's like, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, we're not trying to reinforce crunch culture. That's for damn sure. What, but it's an opt-in situation. We're not forcing people to do it. And I think a lot of people recognize that it's – So, uh, I've had a couple of developers say it's like taking a camping trip. You know, they say it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be sleeping outside. It'll be cold. You might be sleeping on a rocky ground, but you know this going into it. And what's and I do it. Why? Because I like camping and I like being outdoors and it's it's worth it. And so I kind of get that same sense from some developers who say, I know it's not going to be easy, you know, and I'm not going to get as much sleep as I would like, but it's fun in that intense two day period or so um, it's worth, it's worth it just for the outcome. So that's encouraging to hear. Yeah. yeah we have the same statistics uh, for Ukraine. Uh, people return to game jam location, people who work on like commercial, big commercial projects in game development, they want to, to express themselves. So they want to create something new. And speaking about a uh, camping uh, trip, uh, you are 100% right. For example, in our uh, flight academy, we have a faculty of pilots and we have a faculty of uh, um, uh, flight, uh, like uh, rescue, uh, aviation rescuers. So they have all this camping equipment. So to organize uh, the first location, we, uh, we got this camping equipment like tents, sleeping bags, uh, all, the, uh, all the heaters. 
and uh, organized place for the jammers to sleep on the location. And uh, also <laughs> taking into account that it's January in Ukraine, it's very cold. So they had oh uh, warm places to sleep. So quite literally, <laughs> it's like camping. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Yeah, that's, Spe that's speaking amazing. of sleeping, I mean, like say you mentioned it a couple of times now. I mean, do actually do, do people actually sleep or are they kind of really working on the game 48 hours? Yes, yes, and uh, they do, and we recommend them to take a sleep uh, in, uh, inside these 48 hours, because from the experience, the first six hours and the last six hours are the most productive. First, mm -hmm. you generate ideas, you make some prototypes, and uh, then uh, the last three, six hours, you fix some bugs, you get some new ideas, which you think, okay, we have still four hours to complete, <laughs> I can add this to my game. And in the meantime, it's definitely recommended, and we uh, recommend everyone to take a sleep and to check their health status to avoid crunching. Yeah, we, we yeah, that's something we strongly emphasize with our jamming community and we make sure, you know, we let site organizers know that's one of the things that you need to communicate frequently. You know, we even mentioned that in our keynote video too. It's like you gotta take breaks, you gotta pace yourself. It's mm. not a you know, it's it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, you're not gonna sprint for forty eight hours. Um, and I think most people take that seriously. I mean, yeah, there's some people who get super passionate about it. And usually this is the first year in many years where I was not on site somewhere in the world, um, participating on, at a site last year, I was in Israel the year before that. Um, I think it was Egypt and, you know, so it's fun to actually be there and, and to, uh, you know, see what's going on. And, um, so I kind of felt disconnected this year cause I'm just home in Seattle <laughs> watching the streams like everybody else. <laughs> But um, but yeah, it's really important to take those breaks. And I think most people do, you know, because they just realize it's like it's not worth, you know, and, you know, you're not doing your best work if you're at the end of a 48 hours of staying awake. You're just not. And like Alexi said, those last six hours to put the final polish is really important. Yeah, no, that definitely makes a lot of sense. I wonder with, uh, you know, usually, of course, it is. Um, you know, in a physical space and people get together. And then this year, you know, of course it had to be different. Um, do you guys think that in the future there's uh, like possibility that this whole idea of like regions might fall away because people will start to form teams from different regions together and things like that. And is that something that you guys would like to see and encourage or you'd be like, oh, actually that makes things kind of impossible to manage or, or what do you think about that? We, we actually, you know, we in when situations arise, I mean, there's certainly, we actually have partner sites. So sometimes we have sites that partner with another site somewhere else in the world and mm -hmm. just to kind of foster that collaboration. So that's actually a, a, a program that we have. And one of the members of our executive committee oversees that and sees, you know, are there, are there sites that want to partner together? Um, kind of be mm -hmm. co-op sites with one another. Because, um, I mean, that's part of the cultural exchange. It's part of that interaction um, that we really want to uh, foster. And, um, you know, this year it was interesting because of the online format. Like we got people saying, like here in the U.S., saying, well, I'm fluent in Japanese and I would love to participate in a Japanese site, which is something I've never yeah. done before. And I'm like, well, to me, it's like that's really up to the Japanese site organizer, um, you know, to, but – the bigger challenge there is that your time zone is way off from your, your Japanese team members. So if you're willing to, you know, shift your lifestyle for a couple of days and work in the middle of the night, you know, maybe that's going to work for you. Um, that's really the bigger challenge. And so with the online format, we had to encourage as much as possible. And we know that people were interested in joining sites that were not, you know, to their locale. And that's actually one of the interesting aspects of doing the virtual um, format is, is enabling that ability. But we were still encouraging people because geography is not as critical, but time is. And so we said, try yeah. and at least pick something in your time zone or near your time zone so that you're not too offset. And, you know, if your team gives you work to do that, you're not a dependency. Like you're, if you're offset by eight hours and they're waiting to hear from you and you dozed off, um, that could be a problem, <laughs> you know? So that, that kind of, the time logistics of it was a little bit tricky. So, yeah. um, but one of, one of the other things that we've done, we, we implemented this last year, is we have something called the Accessibility Fund. 
And so this is something that is sponsored by uh, some of our, our companies, the sponsored companies. And so the accessibility fund last year, when it was for on-site, it was actually enabling us to do to help sites that had specific needs around accessibility for people who had, you know, uh, physical challenges or you know other challenges where maybe they could bring an interpreter, a sign language interpreter mm. on site. Um, there were a couple cases where like they were in a building that did not have a wheelchair ramp, so they were actually like able to do like a temporary ramp um, and because we are dealing with people all over the world um, like Alexi said in January it's it's you know quite cold in Ukraine but in the southern hemisphere it's quite hot and so we had a couple of sites that needed to rent an air conditioner because they were in a using a space that had no air conditioning but it was sweltering hot where they were and so they were able to, you know, to rent an air conditioner. Um, so that's it, it's a really cool program that got started up um, last year. And that's one of those things that just kind of helps enable people to participate one way or another. So um, we're hoping to keep growing that program. Yeah, amazing. So as far as I remember, program. one year there was a specific oh. diversifier. Like you start making a game together with someone from another location. Yeah, and about the right. time zone different, uh, difference, maybe from Game Jam, maybe from somewhere else, I heard that big time zone difference might be a, a bonus side. Like uh, you have a programmer, the, your artist is sleeping, then uh, the programmer makes mm. <laughs> the programmer's part, goes to sleep, and the artist <laughs> wakes up and uh, draws yeah. all those sprites. Yeah, Actually, that, yeah that's, that's true. That that's can be true. an advantage. It's the team that never sleeps, constantly productive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of gaming behavior in, in some of the online games where you actually have the world divided in like three major time zones. So somebody plays for eight hours, then they hand it over to a person that, like a couple hours away, and then they play for the next eight hours and so forth. So uh, yeah, exactly. it, it doesn't surprise me there. But I had a question earlier about uh, the program in general, like the support that happens between the different game jams. I mean, obviously, you guys are busy like arranging this, this thing and, and have, uh, have this once a year. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about is like, obviously, there are regions with a uh, much stronger support network in general, where I think the, the games industry, the professional part of the games industry is established much more. So even if there's like teams that come up uh, with a cool idea during the game jam, they get a lot of support from that ecosystem. They potentially have it easier to have a like a foot in the door of, of the of their next job or or you know working on a bigger project mm -hmm. or something. So what do you think? What can you already do, or what do you think could be done for those regions that have you know amazing talent to, that that clearly shows in the game jam, but maybe where maybe the ecosystem around is not as present as it is in other territories? Are there initiatives in that regard? Well, there, there, there is a plan. I mean, we have some in, some ideas around that. I mean, it's it's a it's a tougher one to do because, you know, how we can enable that exposure because obviously a lot of developers um, around the world, especially in markets that are like emerging markets, um, they're they're showing incredible talent. You know, they, it's it's obvious in what they're creating during the global game jam, and so then it's a matter of like from that step, it's like okay, it's almost it's almost like they just had a chance to create a a, a game as part of their resume or portfolio and so how do you enable that person to get connected with you know places around the world that might your companies around the world that might be wanting to hire talent and so um, it is something that a lot of our sponsors look at I mean there there are sponsors who expressly are looking for people with talent especially from non-traditional markets and so and especially underrepresented markets and underrepresented people so that's another thing that has been helpful to companies is that they could say because they don't have the resources or, or a lot of them don't have the time they probably do have the resources but it's a matter of priorities, which is a whole nother discussion. But um, but basically when they see the kind of games being made from different parts of the world in the Global Game Jam, it gives them a heads up that, wow, wow, we did not know that, that there was that level of game design experience or expertise in that region or in that country or in that part of the country. And so it mm. kind of gives them a little flag where they can say, maybe we need to do more to check out the talent in that region because we just didn't know. Um, you know, it's, it's just like I had the great fortune. Uh, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to go to Iran uh, 
um, back in 2018 and participate in the Tehran uh, game conference, which was a phenomenal experience. And a lot of people, you know, be, just because of the way Iran is portrayed in a lot of the Western media, um, you know, which is tends not to be in a positive light. Um, of course, that's the political dimension of what's going on um, in Iran. But, you know, there's you know, people on the ground who are living their lives, and there's a huge game developer community in Iran. And of course, we had sites in Iran for the Global Game Jam for the past several years, and it's a very robust community. And you see the talent there that's just phenomenal. And yet, part of the challenge with that is that because of the geopolitical tensions and economic sanctions and things like that, that kind of puts up this wall um, between a lot of companies and access to that talent, which is really mm. a shame. But I'm glad at least through events like the Global Game Jam and, and other events like that, you know, where we have the opportunity to see the talent and what they can do in these different places, um, it does give companies like, you know, certainly there's com uh, companies in parts of Europe or other parts of the world that if even if a North American company might have a challenge engaging with talent in Iran, for example, there's plenty of other places around the world that can and, and don't, you know, aren't, you know, dealing with the same political issues. So that gives me hope because ultimately what I'm what it means is that there's exposure and that we can show that there yeah. is a tremendous amount of talent in these parts of the world. And so how we make that connection right now, it's been mostly on the companies who sponsor to take advantage of what they're seeing coming out of the Global Game Jam. We on the Global Game Jam side, we're not really staffed up to run a program like that, but it is something that we're very aware of. And we'd like to do a better job of seeing how we can you know, help enable that connection with our partners, meaning the, the corporate sponsors. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. And, and I think looking at uh, at this topic, I think it will become more relevant uh, going forward, as we see right now, uh, through the situation that where we were all forced to, you know, work from home, work work remotely, be be connected uh, virtually. I think it opens up possibilities more than ever before for people that may be coming from regions that have been. Uh, you know, uh, suffering from the lack of support a little bit. And now with the exposure that you were talking about, Kate, I mean, they could potentially work with other studios around the world and get their opportunity of, you know, becoming part of, uh, of bigger teams. Since you mentioned uh, Iran before, you know, I, I was in the very fortunate position to have uh, worked for a company that collaborated with a lot of people in Iran. Some of our biggest communities for some of our titles were actually in Iran. It's, it's one of the youngest mm -hmm. populations uh, in the world. And a lot of these guys are gamers. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, didn't really care so much. And I think that's something that, that should change if you become more aware of what's going on um, over there. And then if, you know, you happen to live in a country where the geopolitical issues that you mentioned are maybe not as uh, as dominant as they might be in the United States right now. Um, you know, that's uh, definitely an opportunity there. There will be more and more of those uh, countries, I think, uh, emerging. And uh, hopefully we will have a growing game development scene from my point of view. Yeah, I, I agree. And, I, and I, I'm hoping that this is one of those few silver linings of the pandemic is that the pandemic has basically taken any of that language around like, well, you you know, you we're not giving you relocation assistance and we're not doing this yeah. and we're not, you know, all of that stuff about physical location and, and working for an employer in a certain place is out the window. As we all know, it's yeah. it's gone, <laughs> you know, and even even for <laughs> major companies, you know, we're, they're not even certain yet what what it's going to look like in a post pandemic world world in terms of people coming, you know, and working in a physical location anymore. Um, that's a whole nother topic. But um, but that does give me hope because I think it, sh it, it, it basically eradicates any excuses by companies not to be looking at this talent overseas, not to be looking at the t diverse talent that's all over the place outside of the traditional places where they're looking for this kind of, um, you know, skill set. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that is something that will encourage companies, you know, to say, well, now we're, we're completely unconstrained by geography. So let, let's set our sights farther than we normally do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might uh, kind of level the playing field a little bit. So mm -hmm. I, I do wonder as yeah. well what uh, just work in general will, will look Ooh. like uh, after this. Because I mean, on the one side, you, you sort of hope that not everything goes back to just the way it was before, because you, you kind of want something to have to come have come <laughs> from all of it, right? To to be different afterwards. I mean, in the positive sense. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. 
I mean, if you, if you look at the game jam of the future, uh, you know, 2022, 23 and beyond, I mean, anything you have in mind, like what, what you want to do? I mean, obviously it's a, mm. it's a very big project, you know, and uh, it, it already takes a lot of time, uh, I guess, on the <laughs> side for, for many people uh, to volunteer for that to make it happen. But do you have any like, you know, more strategic thoughts about it, areas where you want to develop it more into certain things you want to do, but you couldn't so far, uh, any ideas? Well, I think part of what part of what we want to do, I mean, there's, you know, we're part of what uh, one of the projects we're working on is our legacy project, which is basically like I think I alluded to earlier about looking back about the, the long term impact of the global game jam, um, not just to the games that got created and the successful games that came out of it. But we also want to know the the industry impact, because, like I said, anecdotally, I meet all kinds of people who will say that the global game jam is where they got their start. So we're hoping that we we can engage some research to actually take a look at that question to see like how many people actually you know working in the industry would would say that that the ggj is an integral part of their how their career got started we're just curious to find out because that also helps inform us for the role that we play as an organization in helping to shape careers and helping to feed talent into the industry even though that's not really our chief mission our chief mission is to mm. basically you know foster collaboration and education but the side effect seems to be you know that we are influencing quite heavily a lot of people's direction into the industry which is that's fantastic i think one of the things that would be great that we want to do is is basically keep building our, our capacity to make those connections between the different uh, jam sites. I mean, I love the idea of doing these co-op sites between like North America and say Southern Africa or wherever the case might be. Mm -hmm. I'd love to build up that program better because I think especially not just for the Global Game Jam event, but more on a long-term basis. So basically, how can we help draw these communities together through the game, the Global Game Jam? Jam event, but then how can they stick together and keep communicating throughout the year to to help each other out? And I think that kind of can also help towards that that uh, you know the emerging talent that we talked about earlier um, that can help expose that talent to places that might be hiring more than where they are. Um, the other thing too is that looking obviously we do at different sites. We have people who set up VR, uh, you know, they've got VR rigs and they make VR games and things like that. It's, it's basically, it's at their discretion. So if somebody is a name, they have the technology, they've got the equipment, you know, they can certainly make a, a global game jam, uh, and you know, they can make a game in VR or AR. Um, but I, I'm hoping that we can, you know, help enable that more. Cause I'd obviously it's a, it's a field that, is ripe for more innovation. So it'd be really cool to see more and more people try it out. But it's just obviously there's a huge hardware uh, point of entry yeah. there. So maybe that's something that we can help um, through having some corporate sponsorships or something. We'll see. And from a location point of view, uh, like every year uh, when Global Games Jam starts, we have a question, when will be the next? Next January. Oh, one year to wait? Uh, so uh, we keep our community engaged. Uh, for example, our colleagues from Odessa, they organize Ukrainian Game Development Cup and uh, they are university as well. And what uh, they managed to do that this was approved by Ministry of Education, like they added this into the curriculum. It was uh, a very uh, great deed to break all these bureaucratic uh, barriers uh, which uh, exist everywhere in education. They did this. And also about one of uh, the events I think you sh I should mention is International Conference on Game Jam, International Scientific mm -hmm. Conference on Game Jams and Hackathons. Uh, this year it will also take place uh, virtually uh, where the researchers... Uh, who are working for their PhD or their postdocs, they, um, uh, they research all these aspects of working in teams, of creating games, of creativity, of uh, technical solutions. They write scientific articles and they can be published and this will be like their scientific uh, uh, research and uh, the article will be published in ACM, for example, like it was in last mm -hmm. year. Yeah, that's that's. I'm glad you brought that up, Alexei, because yeah, the ICGJ 
event that he just mentioned is is an academic event focused on the study of game jams and hackathons. So that's something the Global Game Jam started several years back. And so that's that happens every year and that's it's been growing as well. So if there's academics out there who are interested in the topic, they should definitely check it out. Um, the other thing that we do, and kind of also to Alexi's point, is that we're trying to find other ways to fill that time between, you know, during the rest of the year to engage the community. So, like, since I came on board in, in mid-2019 as the executive director, we've tried to focus on doing more partner jams. So, for example, we did a partner jam with Alexi and his folks in Ukraine with uh, Games for Change. Mm -hmm. So we did a serious games workshop and a serious games jam uh, in Ukraine um, that was based on a grant from the U.S. State Department. Um, but then we've also done a partner jams with different companies, and we're looking at other, you know, potential partner jams throughout the year just to kind of, you know, help our community have something else they want to challenge themselves with. Um, but then, of course, we also have in July, we have our GGJ Next event, which is for mm -hmm. younger people, because the Global Game Jam is focused on 18 or older, but uh, GGJ Next is for 12 to 17 year olds. So kind of hitting that kind of junior high to high school mm -hmm. level of people, because obviously there's a ton of people in that age group who are really interested in game development. But it's a little bit different because obviously we're not going to have people of that age working 48 hours straight. Um, so what we do with GGJ Next is we have a whole week of curriculum. So there's a bunch of great curriculum that's been developed um, by a lot of academics um, who have helped you know, create this curriculum. It's in video form and, and text form. So they spend a week actually learning how to make games, you know, in Unity and other in core and other technologies. And then they then they also then they spend the next whole week make actually making their games. So it's a little more relaxed. It's not as intense as doing mm -hmm. like the Global Game Jam in January. Um, but that's, you know, it's for a different audience, but that's also super fun to do. And it was actually yeah. the GGJ Next last year was our test for doing a virtual event. So we did a virtual version of that last year. It's a much smaller scale than our January event, but it, it went really well. We learned a lot of lessons about running virtual events, which helped us this month or last month. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I think we've only got about the um, community a few themselves, minutes uh, left. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Alexi participated in global game jam on site on the location uh, on this year uh, they uh, they even tend to participate in uh, online jams like ludum dara they also gather in the location because they get uh, want to recreate this feeling of everyone on the same place working on the same thing and this is really great this unites the community and makes it uh, going on mm -hmm. love it it's great um yeah, sir, we only have a few minutes left. I just wanted to make sure that anything else uh, about the Global Game Jam that we have left out or anything else that you'd like to share, super interesting to hear about like the future vision of the jam as well. So uh, that was really great. But yeah, anything that you'd like to to share with us well, before one, we head on? What, one point I want to emphasize, and I think Alexi touched on this earlier, is that the Global Game Jam is open to virtually everybody. It really is literally everybody, anybody who's interested in game development, game creation, any aspect of it. We welcome them to to, to be involved. You don't have to have experience. Um, you know, like Alexi said, there's there's a role to play for everybody. You know, even if it's like a timekeeper, mm. someone to kind of, you know, uh, watch, you know, basically take care of everybody, make sure that everyone's, you know, uh, staying healthy and sleeping and all that. There's a lot of things that you can do. I mean, like, um, you know, so I've seen one of the cool things that I've seen, because typically, you know, on a game team, you're going to have like a programmer or two, you're going to have an artist or two, you're going to have like a narrative designer, you know, so you're going to have like a team that's that the kind of core creatives. That's pretty typical for a game jam team. Um, but, you know, I've seen people show up at game jam sites like there was one guy. I thought this was awesome. So he's a he's a, a composer and he also does um, mm -hmm. audio, you know, sound effects and stuff. So he came into the game jam site. This is a few years ago. He brought his 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 keyboard and he set it up in a corner and then he made an announcement to the whole room. And he said, hey, if you need any if you need music, if you need sound effects, 
I'm your guy. Come and find me. I will make it for your game. That was really smart because he actually ended up having his name in the credits of like two thirds of the games made on that site because <laughs> everyone took a, took him up on his offer because if they could just outsource you know it, the sound effects or music to him and he could just sit in the corner and do it for them they were more than happy to not have to do that while they focused on other stuff so um so I wouldn't let I wouldn't let that limit you. I mean, obviously, most people try and attach themselves to a specific team, but um, there's a lot of creative ways that you can go about still lending your skill to people at a site, um, you know, without actually being attached to a team. So I would encourage people to think really creatively about whatever skills you have, you know, how that might be able to work with a team. And besides about uh, this, how teams are connected and uh, interchanged, uh, there is a scientific research for uh, uh, one year at IGGJ, uh, how people form these clusters and uh, participate in games. And I want to say what I always to say uh, in the question, are there prizes for global game games? So I say the main prize is the game which you completed. Because, you know, many <laughs> Indies, uh, they make one game for a year, for several years, but you have 48 hours and you will have a completed game. It is yours. And then yeah. you can show it to everyone. And then you have the next prize is the knowledge. I can make a game within 48 hours. It is very powerful knowledge. It is very dangerous yeah. as well, because maybe if you have 30 days to make another games and you know, I can make a game within 48 hours, so you will postpone starting till you have only two days left. But anyway, and also <laughs> all those connections, all those friends, all those knowledge, this is your prize for to participate in Global Game Jam. And this is very valuable. So we tell this to everyone and we encourage uh, people to participate in such activities. Well no, said. A really, really good point. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Just seeing something through from start to finish. I think even, you know, since a lot of young people do take part in the jam or people who are trying to get into the industry, I think it's uh, even for people who are hiring, it's a lot more valuable that you can show like here, I did this from start to finish and I did mm -hmm. it within the time frame given me. And like, of course, it's not perfect and not polished, but like, here's the finished thing. Versus just coming yes. in with like a great idea yes. that you may never execute. So just being able to show that you're, you know, able to do that within a team and complete the thing is huge. I think yes. you're, you're totally right. Absolutely. And it's going to, and it's going to stay relevant. I mean, throughout uh, your entire potential career in the games industry, this is one of the most important things that uh, you can see things through to the end. And uh, usually when before, you know, the game gets finished, I think you guys said earlier, like the last six hours uh, of the game jam yeah. usually are the most productive to, together with the first six hours. It's actually the same in, in game development. There's the magic of the, <laughs> uh, you know, the first uh, couple of months of like, you know, coming up with something new. And then at some point you realize, oh, we got to ship this game in about, I don't know, three months, four months or something. Everybody's getting together like, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? And uh, I think that uh, if, you, if you shrink this down to the 48 hours that you have with the Global Game Jam, this is definitely uh, a very, very similar. And it's a great experience um, that you can go through. Love it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I yeah, really, really enjoyed our chat. Um, I Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I will follow up another time as well because I have more questions to ask and brains to pick. <laughs> so I'm working on yeah. uh, a similar but different project. So I'm like, hmm, yes, I would like to pick your brains. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, well, I will thank do that you. as well. You're always welcome. Um, but yeah, I had a, had a lovely time. Thank you so much to Kate and Alexi. Lars, do you have any last thank words? Thank you so much. So nice to speak with you. Thank you. I can only join in. Thank you guys uh, so much. It's, uh, it was just great to, you know, pick your brains about a global game jam. And uh, I think what I can say now is there's, uh, you know, a lot of games out there on the website that uh, we can check out. So if through, through the pandemic, while it lasts, we're bored, you know, I think we can go to the website and, and see all the cool stuff that has been made. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Likewise, yeah, you're thanks again. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I think I think we're still hanging around as <laughs> huh? Oh, now they're gone. <laughs> ah, it's the two of us now. <laughs> it's just us two. Um yes, they just asked. Uh so now we can say bye again. Um thank you, Lars, for your for your 
company. It's been great. Well, th thanks for having me as your co-host. Uh, obviously, with four people, it's sometimes you know hard to <laughs> you know, <laughs> if people all try to to ask questions or speak at the same time. Uh, it's a problem I usually don't have so much with the podcasts because you know then it's the guests talking and I sometimes you know throw in a question or two. Um, but it was a lot of fun, and uh, I look forward to doing this every once in a while uh, going forward. Now it was super fun to co-host this together with you. Yes, no, same, definitely. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks to much, uh, to much. Thanks so much as well to everybody who's watching. Um, have a lovely rest of the evening or whatever time zone you're in, and uh, we'll see you next week. I believe uh, we are going to be showing the gaming awards, um, which kick off. Uh, I think it's at 8 p.m. GMT. I want to say that's correct. Uh, I don't know if somebody can correct me in case. I think it's 8 p.m. GMT. The gaming awards are starting, and we're going to be streaming that on the DevCom channel as well. So really looking forward to that. And then, of course, we've got the Call for Change Summit on the 25th and 26th. Yep, really looking Perfect. forward to that. Bye, everybody. All right. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>